picture, I go back to the Wrigley Building, and then in the middle, yes, right in front of us, the T-R-U-M-P Tower. Uh, this <laughs> building is not part of the East York District, but it is the second tallest building in Chicago, designed by Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill. And just a little bit of trivia, the penthouse at the top, it recently sold for Hello everyone, welcome to the Architect Foundation tour on the Chicago River. I'm going to be minimally speaking. I'm going to allow the, you hear the tour guide, but enjoy a ride on the Chicago River. Let's go. The admission, I paid about $66. This is Wacker Drive that you are seeing here. So, let's let our eye go back to the Trump International Hotel and Tower. And later on, move to the left. And there you see a building that has a little temple. Today, and maybe some of you are staying there. That is the London House. But in 1923, it was not a hotel like it is today. In 1923, this was an office building designed by Alfred Allschuler. I put a temple on the top there. Well, it was a great way to get spectacular views of Chicago. And that was one of the tallest buildings in 1923. Today you can go up there, there's a killer bar up at the top and some spectacular views. So part of the historic district. Uh, and let your eye go to the left of that. And a building that has what we call setbacks at the top. It looks like a kind of narrow tower, but it actually go, all goes on Michigan Avenue. It's just coming up in front of us on the left. This is a 333 North Michigan Avenue building. Architecture constantly is changing, and that building is from the 1920s. Our deco, very much a part of that. So we are coming to the Michigan Avenue DuSable Bridge. 1920, Edward Bennett designed it, and very neoclassical. Uh, this bridge is the kind of bridge we have here in Chicago. It's called a Trunnion Vascular Bridge. What that basically means is it is counterweighted. Kind of like, hello Chicago, <laughs> kind of like a daughter would be. We're very friendly here. Uh, let your eye look over on the left at our, uh, again, river walkway. And you can see that on our left hand side, part has been turned into the Bridge House Museum. It's kind of a cool place if you're into bridges to see how they work. On our left is today the London House. Take a look about a third way up. And there are griffins, winged lions there. <laughs> oh yeah, summer has returned. Uh, you also see the entranceway, and there is a depiction of Fort Dearborn. And on there, this is where that military installation was located in. So redoing this building as a hotel, they decide to kind of expand it, and that's what you see there, and that's Getch. Now this is Wacker Drive, and a uh, percentage of building of our, uh, percentage of the amount of money used for a building is used for public art here. You see that on the left, at the second level, I love this. This is the emergence of beauty. This is about art deco in Chicago that you would find on different buildings here. So we are going across, and you see our river walk on our left. Let your eye go to the front, and we're back to the 1920s. This time, 1926, the building with the temple on the top, the four temples on the corner, they were done by Yve and Dinkelberg with the hopes that people who were jewelers would love this building. They thought they would have more security than in other buildings, so that's one of the first buildings in Chicago to have an interior garage for your car. Now, originally, the top of that building was a restaurant, of the Stratosphere Lounge, and the four corners there, they were part of the fireproofing of the building because there was a fire tank hidden behind each one of those uh, structures. So as we come from underneath the River Walk, we are starting what they call River Walk West, basically. This um, really is Carol Ross Barney and Sasaki, 2005, and they have divided it up into what are called rooms. Some of the needs are different themes. On our left is probably the most solemn, the most respectful part of the river walkway. It is the Vietnam War Memorial. 
It is dedicated to those men and women from the state of Illinois who fought and died in the Vietnam War. There are over 2,000 names on that memorial. So this is a more respectful kind of way to be on the River Walkway. <laughs> we don't think that's the, the way the whole River Walkway is. Uh, what we're going to see coming up on our left is a part of the River Walkway that is called the Marina. And we're going to loosen things up a little bit here. And you can tell we have a wine bar. The see winery is there. But notice how close we are to the water as well. This was meant for smaller boats to be able to come here and I can go dock for a little bit. You go, you get your, your nice glass of wine, and then you sit back and just enjoy the spectacle that this river can be. So coming up in front of us on the left-hand side, you are seeing a, well, you're seeing a Grecian column. But let's face it, no Grecian column like that was ever on the Acropolis. This is a building from the 1990s done by Riccardo Bolfia. And in the 1990s, the kind of architecture that was being done was called postmodern. Now let's go back to the past. Let's, you know, reference it, but don't just copy it. Let's put our own spin on it. So this building, uh, the 77 building, it has a lot of neoclassical details. It looks like a Grecian column. You know, however, that it's got, you know, it's an office building. Take a look at the base there, and it's like somebody chopped off the smaller parts of the and pasted them on. So people think of postmodernism as a kind of theatrical kind of architecture. So this portion of the river walk on our left is called the jetty and we're getting a little funkier, a little beachier. Uh, it slopes down to the water because it is meant for kayakers. And I don't see any of them today, but uh, I guarantee you they will be here later on. And for kayakers to have an easy access to the water and uh, when the tap opens up, Thank you, Willie. again, Appreciate just it. a nice way to enjoy the entire river walkway. So again, these rooms are different themes. Uh, and here, coming up on our left is our river theater, which is meant for big spectacles. And we've had big spectacles on the river. Post-pandemic, we hope to have more. So lots of seating along here. Also, a handicapped accessible ramp. Take a look on the building on your left-hand side that has I go up to the top, and the building shape is kind of like an armchair chair or a throne. This building by Hollywood and Root comes from 1930, and it is a good example with the way it is built of the style of architecture of the 30s. Buildings are going higher. You need light and air into the buildings, so the middle section is taller than the corners. You base up. And as they go up, they allow light and air into the building. So, <laughs> most people would probably not swim in the Chicago River today. Although that has happened. <laughs> and they say we will be doing it again. On our left, this is the water feature. And uh, during the summer months, the water kind of streams from those uh, vertical pipes there, making nice kind of spurts of arcs of water. And again, it's meant for little kids. They don't have, you don't have to jump into the Chicago River. You can the water park part of that. And as we are coming along here, you can notice that we've done maybe about 10 years ago, and very different ridge houses, because they weren't all done at the same time all at different parts. Okay, so I am a retired Chicago public school teacher, so on our left hand side, yeah, <laughs> all right. Let's hear it for school teachers. Yay. My people. On the left, this is called the Jetty, and it's very dear to my heart because this is of the city of Chicago. It's meant to be an educational area for the ecology of the river. Before the pandemic, they were even teaching kids how to fish here. Now, take a look 
at the jetty all the way to the uh, left hand corner there and you can see there's like a projection box that's exactly what that is because that at night just at sunset will project images across the river to the largest movie screen in downtown Chicago the Mart and it will be happening tonight uh, and it's tonight it's got digi digital images uh, done by Chicago high school students. So we are coming to where the three parts of the river come together. Called the On our left, there's a green reflective glass building that has this wonderful curve in its wall. And if you notice, what's happening with the boat right now? We're making a curve in the river here as well, following the curve of the river. reflection of all the different buildings that are along here. You couldn't ask for a better building than Now this is the end of our river walkway and you know we do have a handicapped accessible uh, walkway but you know we've taken the fact that they haven't built it up and made it our own because now it's a great place for art installations such as on our left Chicago neighborhoods done by the Chicago street artist whose name is Don't Fret. Uh, this will stay up for a while. Adirondack chairs and putting them out here later. I gotta tell you there is no better summer place to be on the river. Than but as we come to the three branches let's take a look in front and to the left. We have a building that's kind of like a ballet dancer on point. Riverside Plaza. And what you have is a until the eighth floor. As we make our turn into the North Branch, in front of us on our left with that red kind of feather-like area, this is Picard Chilton and this is River Point. Now take a look. There's a bend in the wall there. You also have these wonderful arches at the top and at the base. And the building has moved away from the river. It's almost like on a, a pedestal, right? There's a reason for that. Take a look at those circular uh, kind of portholes that you see there. Behind those are active railroad lines. The trains are running in front of this building. And so back and I have that bend in it for following the bend of the tracks. So we have now moved on to the North Branch. Traditionally, this has been candy manufacturers, uh, you know, industry is here. That is changing. No. To market on our left, this is River Bend. Uh, River Bend is a very narrow building. All of those uh, condos and this, uh, is a building from the early 2000s, has great views of the lakefront. Mm, well, they did in the early 2000s. Not so much anymore. So, on our left-hand side, this red brick building, it's the oldest building you're going to see on this tour. This building from 1898 was originally a cold storage warehouse. Imagination a little bit. No a lot of those windows were not there. You know, the walkway. Well, in the early 1980s, an architect by the name of Harry Weiss decides to reconvert this building. Chops out windows, puts in balconies. <laughs> it takes them you know, 15 months just to get this building together to make it a... But you know, most of that was just defrosting the building. So, as we come here, Harry Weiss on our left-hand side, these are some of his new constructions. They're called his Riverfront Cottages. He loved the triangular form. And you really see here. You saw this from the street very differently. Um, it must be only one of the original owners from the 1980s has sold. That was in 2015 for about 2.5 million dollars. So this on our left hand side is called the Kinsey Park. Again, 
warehouse is Cannon Candy Manufacturers. But this is today Kinsey Park by Papa George Hames with the tower by Mabel Hartree. Well, it's very much a residential uh, neighborhood. And what have they done? They've opened up to the river. We got the walkway, we got windows, we've got balconies. No putting your back to a smelly industrial river for this area. But compare that to the other side of the river. Now this is the east bank. In the 1970s, Mr. Gordon and Jack Levin. In the 1970s, we didn't want to know what was going up and down this river. So there were no windows. This was concrete wall. Well, today, of course, everybody wants to be close to the river. And so they put some windows in there and river walkway as well. Uh, take a look on the left at the river walkway. Yes, I would be remiss if I did not give credit to a citizens group here. The Friends of the River. They worked with the city of Chicago to create a law, an ordinance that said, yes, hello, uh, to an ordinance that said, yes, please, come build on. Is that Maybe a little bit? Okay, uh, the ordinance to get this river walkway said, yes, come build on it, but only anytime you get new construction, you must have a river walkway. And where is that chocolate smell coming from? Lomer Chocolate Factory is just behind uh, these buildings. And when they're in production, believe me, you smell it all over the world for a belief. So on our right here, this little... I can remember when this was an abandoned building. Today, it is a riverfront loss. Uh, from the early part of the 20th century, it belonged to the railroads. Uh, of course, no balconies at that time, not so many windows. And this bottom portion here is not river walkway because this is not new construction. It's redoing the building. That is a good example of what happens in this river north area. Old warehouses. Residential kinds of architecture. One exception to that we're seeing on our left, uh, excuse me, on the right here, is the Kingsbury District. Now, the Kingsbury District, all of this land on the right hand side was originally owned by the Montgomery Brewer Corporation. You know, in Chicago, you may not know the name of the court. 1871 starts a catalog company. By the turn of the century, it got, goes from one page to over 200 pages. The company lasted all the way into the 2000s, but unfortunately went bankrupt. All of this land was sold. Now the good news is today, Chicago Park District, and it is appropriately called the Montgomery Ward Park. Most of this is new construction from the early 2000s. There are a few exceptions there. So just take a look in front of us, and on the right you see blue reflected glass and white corners. That is a building from the late 1970s, but done by Minoru Namasaki, one of the designers of the original World Trade Center. And that was Montgomery Ward's corporate headquarters. Today, it is a condo development called the Montgomery. We got a little pocket parks here. On our right hand side, you see a piece of public art done by a Chicago artist by the name of Ginny Sykes. It is called Aurora, and it is built on the remains. Everybody is so happy to be out. That's why everybody's like, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's built on the remains of an old swing bridge here in Chicago. And on that theme of everybody's so happy to be out, take a look on your right. We've even got a little doggy park <laughs> that seems very, very busy today. Now, these buildings on our right, notice that they are built on a slope. And these were done by the architecture firm of Papa Drew James. Now that sloping on the river, then on Larrabee, the street behind it. But the real discussion about these buildings is the color choice of the facade, the outside. This kind of mellow yellow kind of color. Um, you know, designers for Papa George James came here, scoped out the neighborhood and said, there's a lot of reinforced concrete, glass, and steel. 
this river needs a little bit of color. So as we are coming along here, take a look to the front of the boat and on the right, we have come to the Montgomery Now, the Montgomery Ward Warehouses was a huge complex. And again, owned by the Montgomery Ward uh, Corporation. Uh, it had been the first building we're seeing on our right was done in 1930 by an in-house architect from Montgomery Ward by the name of William McCauley. Art Deco, very much a part of that age, so this building has a lot of those elements. It's vertical, take a look also at the medallions there. Now, two things that were not there in 1930 were River Walkway and all those hanging balconies. So, that River Walkway, they wanted to build out into the river, but the river is just wide enough here. So how did they achieve it? They took from the interior space of the building to create the river walkway. So as we are coming from underneath the bridge, we're seeing on our right some of the original decoration. The first building we are seeing uh, was done by Richard Schmidt and we are in 1906 to 1909. And uh, today these are offices. Uh, the building was done in the prairie school style, much more horizontal than vertical in its design. Also the medallions there, very much in uh, the prairie school style. Walkway achieved by taking from the interior. So do we have condos? Oh, of course we do. Let your eye go all the complex are less decorative. That was an addition in the 1940s. Today, those are the condos. You might say, well, who wants a condo on the river without a balcony? No one. Uh, so what you have, well, maybe somebody, but not the most popular item. Take a look at the very top there where the balconies are. They have taken from interior space to create the exterior balconies. This is as far north as we're going to go. Uh, this is Goose Island in front of us. It was created by our first mayor by the name of Ogden. And his brothers were excavating clay for bricks and created a chill you see on the right. Still has an industrial part to it. It was certainly industrial in the past. But there is a new development that is scheduled here and that will be called Halston Point. And it will, as all developments, Way. There will be parkland as well. All of Goose Island basically is changing from industrial much more to residential. And we still got a little bit of industrial, such as the cement making area on our right hand side there. But as we make our turn here, let's take a look. Well, on our right, we have the Chicago Freedom Center done by Skidmore Owings in the mid 1970s. That's where the Chicago Tribune a newspaper has been printed. But let your eye go to the front of the boat on the left. And then there is a statue on a little kind of stepped pyramid. That is Diana the Huntress. But we like to rename things here in Chicago, so we don't call her that. <laughs> we call her the Spirit of Progress. Uh, Montgomery Ward loved this idea of a statue on the top of his building, especially for mythology. So he has one here, and he also has one on, or had one, on his on Michigan Avenue. So take a look on your left. Again, these are all offices. Uh, it has just gone through a wonderful kind of just restoring of the facade here. These are the only part of the historic places. And when they first opened, they were some of the largest uh, warehouses in the entire country. So we are coming back to the bridge here. So let's start talking about the Chicago Tribune. If you haven't followed the Chicago Where Should We Put Our Casino saga, this has been <laughs> one of the major contenders. Now, this building, named the Freedom Center, uh, has traditionally been where, and still is, where the Tribune newspaper is uh, printed at. 
However, the Chicago Tribune is mostly selling real estate and not buying it. And one of Red Place and Casino uh, Will that happen? Well, the alderman in the area says, no thank you. Uh, that's a new kind of development this past week. But stay tuned to see if this building stays here. It's been up for sale for about, uh, I don't know, at least five years. But do you notice something here? No windows. They had great ideas. That they would bring the paper for the printing presses on barges. These doors on our right hand side would then open up. They would automatically be able to put the paper directly to the printing presses. Sounds great. Except uh, the rivers just and that meant they were going to have to dredge the base, the bottom of this river. Believe me, nobody wants to disturb what's at the bottom of this river. So they decided, well, we'll just bring it by the trains on the other side. So as we are coming along here, we are seeing on our left, again, the Kingsbury District. And what you're seeing is a lot of residential towers. One of them is still under construction. And uh, what you'll see a little bit further to the east are some of the towers of the Michigan Avenue. Uh, what you also have here, uh, just on your left hand side behind the black water tank, uh, and it is one of the first uh, part of the residential design in it was so popular that a sister building was built in 2004, the original in 2002. And as we are coming along here, again, we are back to the remains of the old swing bridge, which have been turned into a nice little park area as well. And coming up in front of us on the left, Solomon Cordwell and Benz, and that is called Park Place also from 2002. And as we're coming along here, it's easy to look at Kingsbury on the left here and go, oh, of course, very, you know, lots of residential construction. Hear that over on the right-hand side. This is land that traditionally has been industrial. And as you can tell, uh, not so much by these, but usually, there are a lot of Tribune uh, kind of trucks that are along here, most of this land is still owned by the Chicago Tribune. Uh, from the time of Mayor Emanuel, this area has been redesignated from industrial into, again, uh, residential. So there have been lots of plans to redo this section of the river. More than likely, they will happen. But we grow incredibly rapidly. In fact, at one point, they consider us the fastest growing city on the planet. Things go well here until, of course, the date of the Great Chicago Fire. But I am here to tell you we have completely exonerated poor Mrs. O'Leary and her cow, <laughs> even though the fire did start at Coven Street, not far from her home. So if it wasn't Mrs. O'Leary and it wasn't the cow, what started the Great Chicago Fire? We were in wooden city. Our streets were made out of wood, our houses were made out of wood, and it had been this really entire Midwest. In fact, there was a worse fire on the same base of the Chicago Fire up in Peshawar, Wisconsin. But we always knew. By 1893, we wanted to show the world that we, by the world, by the way, I, I mean New York, that we were back. So how do you do that? Yeah, the World's Fair, known as the Columbian Exposition, took place in Jackson Park. One building left from that fair, Museum of Science and Industry. Okay, well, I gotta tell you about one more disaster, and this was not a fire, it was a flood, and it happened about where we are right now. 
in front of us. The base of that bridge, they were fixing some pylons. We're talking April 13, 1982. They're fixing those pylons and they forget something they should never have forgotten. That under boat, underneath this <laughs> city, uh, under a series of tunnels, freight tunnels, dug in the beginning of the 20th century. 50 miles of freight tunnels. And those tunnels connect to major buildings in our downtown area. So they break into that tunnel system. They flood out not only all 50 miles, but basements and sub-basements of the 22 feet of water. And the thing that killed most Chicago, they didn't know how to fix it. For a whole week, we'd come home and watch them throw mattresses and garbage and whatever they could find on that hole. Yeah, at the end of that time, they finally were able to fix it with two of one billion dollars. All right, so here we are on our left-hand side. This is River Moore Point. Uh, used to be the, uh, excuse me, uh, apparel. Rowings and Merrill originally designed this in the 1970s. Of course, they have added those windows. This bridge, by the way, we are going under, not broken. Use it anymore. However, the railroads must actually raise and lower it at least once a year in order to maintain control of it. To the confluence. On our left, we're going to see this better from farther away. This is the Wolf Point development. But as we head to the confluence, we're going to see you know, not only where the three branches come together, but take a look in front and on the left to the Nuveen building. Now again, this is that building with that wonderful kind of bend in the wall. You just have to love the reflective quality that you get. Coming up in front of children and that wonderful parabolic arch at the base, uh, this building again has in front of it uh, a sculpture done by Santiago Calatrava. It is called Constellation. Uh, could be a feather, could be a plume, a plume of fire. But in front of us, on the right, we are back to James Getch's 150 Riverside Plaza. Why have that triangular shape at the base, have the building not go out to the 8th floor? Well, it's the shape of the lot. It has the river on one side, and then it is closed in trains on the other. For the longest time, over 80 years, this was just empty land. Nobody thought you could build there. But by making this shape, you are able to build a building that allows you to have more room in the base for public space, but also allows your building to come to its full width above. Uh, again, this is James Getch and on the river. And we have this building. And coming up in front of us and on the left, you're seeing another reflective glass building that kind of has setbacks to it. trapezoidal in shape, determining the shape of the building. All right, so we are now on, it's all about candy and manufacturing. The South Branch, it's all about the trains. So we see how the trains have affected the building that is triangular shaped at the base. Take a look at the building, the Boeing building, coming up is by Perkins and Will. Around it, or in this case, over the active 
Roman wines. We can't see that because they have Boeing buildings straddles over those active railroad lines. They've covered it over, creating this nice little park. Alright, so James gets his Riverside Plaza 150. It moves itself away from the train tracks. The Boeing building goes over the train tracks. And coming up on our right hand side, this building is from 1929. And this is Oliver and Millet. What are Deco Country Town to it? Uh, today it is called uh, Two North Riverside Plaza, but in 1929, this was the Daily News newspaper building. What did they do? Well, active railroad lines, they moved their building as far to, away from the river as they could, then they covered over the railroad tracks, creating what is considered probably the first outside plaza in downtown Chicago. And even though it has a lot of Art Deco detailing, the building really is more horizontal in its design. So, coming up, the right hand side. Again, we're still dealing with those trains. We're going to go to the 1950s into the 1980s. These buildings on our right were all done by the architecture firm. And unfortunately, they are doing some construction so we can't see it. Hopefully you have guessed by now that these buildings are actually straddling over active railroad lines. And there are about eight of them. They start building in the 1980s, excuse me, 1950s, they go to the 1980s. And you take a look at it and you are seeing that Miesian that era. What do I mean by that? Well, the ideas of Mies van der Rohe. What were some? Take a look at the building on our right. Mies. So don't go looking for any kind of gargoyles, triumphal arches. Nope, what you get here is basically a rectangular box that is flat on the top. The walls, the walls have been replaced with glass. All right, they cheat a little bit. And that you've got those pieces of steel they run up and down them. Those are called I beams. And they have no structural validity. So railroads, railroads and more railroads. Today we only have two railroad stations left. And this is a whole area of railroads. One of them is on your right river. That limestone smaller building is Union Station, which has been considered one of the five great railroad stations in the country. And again, today we have Union Station here, and we also have the Overland Center. So, as we are moving here, that will be coming up in front of us on the left-hand side. So, it has two black sections to it. Middle section that has kind of a mural there has a little red marker on it. The building is from the 1970s. And in the 1970s, we put our back to the river. So originally, this building had the glass and the steel, and then the middle section was just a concrete wall. Not anymore. We don't put our back to the river anymore. Now we have this wonderful mural in the middle with that red marker marker that you see on maps. It's depicting uh, the uh, basically a map of the Chicago River. And again, uh, the facade of this building in such a way. We used to just pass it by. Now we just can't help but chuckle when you see it. All right, so this is the end of the Gateway series. We are closer to the trains, but you can now see this Amtrak, which is probably coming from the station, uh, is underneath this building. So all of the Gateway buildings do straddle over it. This is just infrastructure, some work. And it's about time to let you in on a Chicago secret. 
We love the words world's biggest here. Mm -hmm. And coming up in front of us on the right hand side was at one time the world's biggest post office. It's a building done by Graham Anderson Post. The expressway entrance. It was such a big building that it was started in the 1920s, not finished to the 1930s. And Home Chef. It is no longer a post office. It is now a redone office building, which is such great news because for a long time this building was empty. Uh, we are coming here. You see the Congress uh, Bridge here. It actually goes right through the middle of our old post office. Now the post office, or this building, was the post office until the 1990s when the postal system said, yeah, big, beautiful, and adequate, moved out. Uh, it was basically maintained to about 2004, but then an Englishman by the name of Bill Davies bought it, gave great plans, and and built it in the The good news is it has just gone through an $800 million restoration. This is a huge building, but it is filling up with many different kinds of offices. On our left, this, well, welcome to the new south side. Uh, this used to be land that was uh, where the old Grand Central Station was located at. The early 1970s, they teared on the station. They had great plans, they were going to do lots of development, none of them happened. And for over 30 years, this land has just kind of left. In fact, uh, this used to have one of the largest homeless populations all along the river frontier and was all in Rome. Today it is the river line, excuse me, and the South Bank development. You are seeing some of the development here. Most of this is residential that you see with the grant, the ultra grant here. New construction with the Cooper is the building in front of us as well. Uh, the landscape architect, Herr Schultz, uh, is responsible for the river walkway that you see there. And again, it's kind of a naturalistic kind of way of trying to join uh, the residential part to the river. I think a cool element is coming up. You're gonna see some limestone stairs here. Those were actually part of the foundation for the old Grand Central Station. Uh, when they came to redevelop this area, they found that and decided to make it into a more artistic kind of area and to incorporate it into the design of uh, the riverfront park here. And yeah, this is, a, I've been watching this go up for the last couple of years. Uh, this is actually the reed uh, and uh, basically it is part of this river line development. So it's kind of easy to picture lots of development here. But, you know, most of this has just begun in the 1980s after we redid the museum campus, which is just to the east of us here. Up until that time, there were, this was, you know, basically empty or industrial or railroad. One of the few buildings from the mid-1980s that are here is on front of us and on our left. This is River City. River City, done by Bertrand Goldberg, 1985. It was a city within a city concept. Uh, bring your boat here. It can stay all winter long. It's aerated. Uh, and inside, there are atriums that have shops and restaurants and offices. Windows look to the outside, but they also look to the interior as well. And of course, Bertrand Goldberg, the wonderful architect, loved to experiment with the circular or oval form. You can definitely get that with the same kind of feel that is part of this building. Started out rental, went condo, and just a couple of years ago, it has gone rental again. But again, for the longest time, this was out here by itself. It had no neighbors. But today, today, lots of new South Side residential living. And if you're gonna have that, well, on both the left and the right, you gotta have shopping. We have on our right, Eckenhoff Saunders, Southgate Market, and the Roosevelt Collection on our left. And 
all of those buildings behind it, well, basically again, those are all taken from an industrial area into a residential area after a museum campus was developed. So, we're not going to go much further along the river. Uh, in front of us, we're going to see Roosevelt. But you do see on your right hand side at the river's edge, probably the most endangered building along the riverfront. Uh, this is from the 1920s, and it used to be a power station for Union Station. Uh, Preservation Chicago would like to save this building, uh, however the railroads uh, would like to tear it down. So if you're interested in that at all, Preservation Chicago has a uh, petition on their website. So, in front of us, and on our right there, this of course is Roosevelt Road. Uh, Roosevelt Road uh, has been just to the uh, south of it, uh, more land that will be part of the Riverline development. But if you kept on going south, you would come to the Chinatown area, uh, Ping Tong Park, uh, which was uh, basically a small park designed for the people of Chinatown. But if you want to keep going further, you're going to come to the newest neighborhood in Chicago. They're calling it the 78. It is so big. Over 60 acres. The University of Illinois has got a new think tank being developed there as well. And it's also, you know, a proposed site for the new casino, um, if that ever happens. Uh, the 78 is basically so big. We have 77 uh, neighborhoods in Chicago. This will become our 78. But as we make a windy turn along here, take a look in front of the boat. I always have to make sure it's still there. Um, I gave a tour during a, a rainy day and it wasn't um, covered in fog. But that big black building with the white TV antennas on the top, no, that is not the seahorse. It is the Willis Tower. All right, this is where I begin to lose you. Okay. Um, but, you know, I have friends and relatives who say, I'm never calling that Willis, it will always be Sears to me. Cool. Except, you know, Sears has been gone since the 1990s. The Willis and Insurance Company has brought a lot of attention to an aging building. But let's pretend. Let's pretend it's 1974 and the Sears Roebuck Company wants a downtown statement office in downtown Chicago. And so, for the very first time in the entire history of architecture, a building goes up 110 stories, 1,451 feet, designed by Skidmore, Owens, and Merrill. It's a series of tubes, and the tubes drop off until you only have two remaining at the top. Okay, it is no longer the world's tallest building. That boat has sailed. But you know, Willis did keep its title all the way until the 1980s, a time of very different CAD and computer systems. Uh, interesting to note, Willis no longer exists. It has, is an insurance company that has been bought by Aon. And so, uh, we already have an Aon tower here, so will they be renaming this building? Maybe. All right, I'm gonna just step off just for a minute, give you a chance to stretch your legs, and I'll get a little bit of water. I'll be right back. Thank you so much for joining in. This is uh, the Chicago architecture tour on a boat through the river. It's hosted by the Architecture Center. And uh, I spent $66 because I bought it online. I think if you buy in person, you won't spend the, the booking fees because they use Ticketmaster for some reason. Um, but it's really fun. So I'm going to continue showing it to you uh, with minimal narration. I hope you enjoy it. And let me know where you're watching from. And um, patreon.com slash urbanist is a way.
spawn spontaneously and show you a cool architecture tour. All right, let's go. Okay, so take a look on the right hand side. Uh, there is the Board of Trade building with the statue on top. That is the Goddess of Grain series. Uh, there is an addition by the architect Helmut Jahn done in the 1980s with his own addition of the trading floor. And unfortunately, Helmut Jahn um, had a tragic bike accident last uh, summer uh, and was killed. Uh, he was a prolific architect here in Chicago as well as everywhere in the United States. In front of us, on our right hand side, the Pickish building that has the crown on top. This is a 311 building. It's a 65 story reinforced. And if you walk in Chicago at night, the, those lanterns, lanterns, there are five of them on the top, light up. But of course, this is migratory bird season here, and so they are dimmed at this time of year. And as we are coming along here, again, our old post office uh, now gone through a total renovation process. Uh, and as we come from underneath the, the bridge, you can see lots of cars going to the expressway. We're going to be looking on the right to, of course, This is actually one of five environmentally friendly air conditioning plants in the downtown area. So go back to Willis and go to the left hand side. Let your eyes go up to the hundred. Ah, yes, those little glass rooms that you can go outside and look 103 floors down a five state area. A couple of years ago, a tourist went out there and the protective began to crack. Now they tell us he was perfectly okay. But it had to be a heart stopping moment. Now they've just gone through a renovation process of the Willis, replacing all of the windows for uh, a new kind of observation area. And what I think was funny that was during when they were thinking about what new accessible people could repel down the Willis Tower. Uh, that hasn't happened and I doubt very much that it will. So you're here in the trains on our left hand side, a very much a part of this section of the river. And coming up on our left, we see Fitness Formula Club today. Uh, the Xing on here, those are structural elements. This building, part of the gateway series for one of the exchanges here. They want a clear open area and so they put their structural elements on the left side. Well, they moved out and of course today it is the fitness club itself. We're seeing on the left, uh, that's the river walkway done by Skidmore and it's about to be redone. Park used to be an above ground parking garage, and we're back to triangles. And triangles in Chicago always been Harry Weese. This is the 200 Wacker. Uh, it's actually two triangles that were put together. And take a look at the lobby area there inverted triangular spaces giving you two river taxis have become a very big thing here. Uh, you know, when we were redoing Wacker Drive, and for an easy way to get around Chicago. But as we are coming along again, what we are seeing again are all of the gateway buildings. Let your eye go in front of the boat. And of course, of course what you see right away is the clock for the Boeing building. This is Perkins and Well, 1990s and it straddles over active railroad lines. 
So they build their vertical tower where the clock tower is. But there's another section to this building, the horrible kind of element there. We call it the bustle. So they are building out from they come to a problem. The bustle is a little bit too close to the railroad tracks. And so how do they solve that? They can't put their caissons where they want them. Those trusses that at the top are actually holding up too close, they're holding up that section of the uh, building itself. And they like them. They say, you know, this kind of looks like bridges along the river. It's called a metaphor for the bridges themselves. On our right, this is Fujian John, Fujikawa. Chicago Mercantile Exchange. And let's take a look on our front and to the left. We of course see two North Riverside Plaza. And let your eye go behind it to that glass reflective building. And notice that you have kind of a waterfall Art Deco effect there. That's Helmut Jan. And that is where uh, it's called the City Court Building. And that is where uh, the at the base. They needed a lot of room, not so much for the uh, offices above it. On our right, I actually, I actually heard somebody singing this when I was building before. This is the Civic oh, Opera wow. in 1929. Graham Anderson, Probst, and White. This was built for the Civic Opera, but today the Lyric Opera performs here. And the Lyric, of course, is uh, in the country. Uh, it has those uh, kind of Art Deco comedy and tragedy masks too. If you get a chance to go here, wonderful Art Deco hobby done by Jules Guerin. And um, again, the Lyric did a wonderful season this year and we'll be back again next year as well. Wow. So, James Getch, we saw 150 Riverside Plaza, strange lot line, he solves the problem James Getch again. Trapezoidal kind of lot line. Those setbacks above are how you have uh, the building have enough space with the with the uh, office area. Here with those kind of triants, which he gives off 50% of the base of this building is given up to public spaces. Now, also take a look that there's that wavy kind of aluminum at the base. It used to be part of the facade for a building that was here before. Uh, Inc., also known as Morton Soul Company. Mid 20th century, had that as part of their design. They decided to incorporate it as a link with history. And we are headed on our left, James Getch's 150. You can see the people walking along there. Behind it, uh, the red brick is a condo development, the Randall Street Condos. And in between, well, the trains are. And what did they do? They covered them over. So there's a nice little there. And as we are coming back to the confluence, we are seeing in front of us a building under construction. That is the Salesforce Tower. Pele, Clark, Pele are the designers of that building, which will be an office building. Uh, that one is actually the smallest, excuse me, it is 58 stories. Uh, and to the right is Wolf Point East, which is 60 stories. And to the left, Wolf Point West. Now this uh, construction here was quite controversial in the beginning. They thought they were going to be super talls here, and that never materialized. But just the fact that they were able to get these three towers on this very for the longest time was a parking lot. Okay, so we're moving back to the main branch. Wolf Point, the Mart, in front of us. Great view of 300 North the South by Picard Chilton. All of that glass. Now the 300 here takes advantage of its sight on the river and in doing so they've opened 
a protective covering on the glass, which gets rid of the ultraviolet rays of the sun. And this building has won a platinum LEED designation, Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design. They also use the river as part of their cooling, but have agreed to make sure that it comes back to the river, the water, in a cleaner way. Okay, on our left here, yeah, that big movie screen, but it's also from 1929, known today as the Mart, but in 1929, it was the Merchandise Mart, built for the estate of Marshall Field, who wanted to expand into the wholesale furniture business. 1929 is not a good year for expansion. <laughs> and so what happened by the 1940s, this building was in bankruptcy, and so Look at uh, the kind of bus, other public schools here. David Letterman came to Chicago and we called that our Pez Gallery of important realtors. Ward, Huntington Hartford, Marshall Field as well. Uh, the Kennedy family owned this well into the 1990s, but today it is owned by the Vornado Realty Trust. And again, it is an Art Deco inspired building. Originally had a lot of designers and furniture people in here. Today, much more of a high-tech kind of uh, basic tenant in the building. But as we are coming That's along, where we went inside a few days ago. Day, my goodness. Take a look on your left-hand side, and that is the building, the platinum lead building that you are seeing there. And in front of us, there it is on the left hand side, of course, where it says Whirlpool and you have a clock. This is one of my favorite buildings uh, on the uh, tour. It was originally from the early part of the 20th century, and at that time it was known as the Re Murdoch. Uh, it was done by Nimmons, very famous uh, warehouse architecture architect, and um, it was a food storage warehouse. Uh, it's been many things, though. If you're from Chicago, maybe you remember when there was traffic court in there as well. Uh, wonderful prairie school kind of design to the side of this building. On our right-hand side, this today is a side of the worst maritime disaster in Chicago's history. <laughs> yeah, uh, worst maritime... Okay, let me see you. All right. <laughs> the site of the Eastland disaster. Eastland disaster, July 24th, 1915. There were three boats to bring employees of the Western Electric to a picnic in Michigan City. They start to board the first boat, the Eastland, and it begins to tip. And trying to right it, they capsize that boat. And even though they were at dock, over 800 people died in that disaster. Coming up on our left hand side, we we'll move into the 1980s. Today this is the American Bar Association, uh, but originally this is where Quaker Oats was located at. And they have really developed this riverside kind of uh, seating area there. In front of us on our left, we are finally to Chicago's Corn Cob Building, Bertrand Goldberg. Bertrand Goldberg, again, love that circular form, and this he started in 1950. Uh, it is completed in the late 1960s. The game is a city within a city concept. What was happening, a lot of people were leaving Chicago, moving to the suburbs. So this is a way to say, oh, you don't want to live out there. Come back. We'll give you everything you need and you never have to leave. Uh, here's your boating area. Park your car. There were restaurants, a bowling alley, stores, an ice skating rink and an office tower all located there. And of course, if any of you are movie aficionados, maybe you remember Steve McQueen, the movie The Hunter, who drives his car off of these buildings into the Chicago River. We're back to Mies van der Rohe. Mies van der Rohe in front of us on the left was originally the IBM building. The IBM building uh, was designed by Mies uh, right before his death in 1969. It's his last time. It's also the second tallest building Mies ever designed. Today, IBM has moved 
Dow put in is the American Medical Association and the Bayman Hotel. Now, Lee's probably the most copied architect of the 20th century. Most critics would tell you there's something beautiful about a Mies inspired building. Take a look at how you have the attention to details with the corners, the shape of the building, its proximity to the other buildings as well. As we're coming from underneath here, we saw this building on our left earlier, the second tallest building in Chicago, the Trump International Hotel and Tower. Uh, designed by Skidmore Owings and Merrill, Adrian Smith, this is last design before he went into his own partnership with Smith Hill. Uh, what we have here, very traditional for uh, Skidmore to have this tripart ribbon walkway here. It's a reinforced building, uh, and a reinforced concrete building, uh, multiple use, condo, hotel, offices. Uh, what I find is really interesting is that when Skidmore first opened up the building, uh, what they said it was, well, it's 92 stories. But uh, the Council on Tall Buildings and Urban Habitat said, no, that's wrong. It's really 98 stories. Okay, the building is not growing. It is, you know, where do you count? Do I count from the river? Do I count from the door? Do I count the spire? We're back to the Ridley Building, and there, coming up with the American flag on the top, well, our only Gothic skyscraper in Chicago, in downtown Chicago, the Tribune Tower. 1925, the result of a worldwide competition, won by Hoods and Howell for, quote, the world's best building for the world's best newspaper. Check out those flying buttresses up at the top. Well, the Tribune Tower has been sold. It is no longer where the Tribune is published. It is today been turned into a 160 uh, designed by Solomon and Program and Benz. I guess you could call it the world's best combo power. Uh, we are back, oh, by the way, the Chicago Tribune sign for this day. Uh, the, again, Apple Store on our left. And what the Apple Store really wanted to do was to create an inside, outside, bring the outside in the kind of feel to it. Uh, where are, you know, where's the genius bar? It's underground. Um, again, we had an Apple store. This one is much, you know, more impressive. Uh, where you see the Fidelity sign, that's a Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill building. Bruce Graham and Natalie Lloyds uh, were the designers of that building. The Chicago, the University of Chicago Center, and I saw some graduates out on the bridge earlier today. This was designed by Dirk Lohan. Uh, this is where the business school uh, for the UFC and continuing education are located. I've taken classes in there. There are no windows in any of the classroom buildings. Great views, though, from the faculty and student lounges. NBC Tower, 1990s, Skidmore, Owings and Merrill, doing postmodern Art Deco, Art Nouveau. And about two-thirds of the way up, we have some flying buttresses paying homage to verticality with those ribbons of windows. So the bridge in front of us is the Columbus Drive Bridge, one of the largest trunk vascular bridges. But what's really cool is take a look on your left to the relief sculpture called Chicago Rising from the Lake. Done by the Chicago artist Milton Horn in the 1950s, it used to be on a parking garage in downtown Chicago. It's a woman, she's coming from the lake, she's got her arm around a, uh, again, a roll and she's a wheat. Interesting to know, we tore down the parking garage, save the sculpture. Years. They have been so cool. about it. On our left, this is the Sheridan Hotel, Salmon, Cordell, and Benz. Early 1990s, check out all of those windows. Everybody wants to be close to the river. And by the 1990s, we have River Walkway. Now, all of this land on the left hand side of the boat, this is landfill. Some of it from the time of the Great Fire of 1871. And today it is one of the hottest real estate areas within the city. Multiple use kind of buildings from hotels, offices, condos, townhomes, they're all here. 
Uh, one of the earlier buildings is the city front center where you see Lizzie uh, McNeil's on there as well. Notice how they kind of hurt that building around to give everybody a good view. But this kind of breaks my heart. On your left hand side, there's a fountain. The fountain uh, is the Nicholas J. Mellis Centennial Fountain and Water Cannon. And it was designed by Dirk Lohan, who, by the way, is the Queen's Man to go. And did you see where that pyramid is in the middle there? Well, pre pandemic, it used to shoot an arc of water over the Chicago River. It has not been on for the last two years, and we have checked with the Metropolitan Water Information District. It's probably not going to get turned on this year either. Uh, which is very sad because it was always a fun thing. It turned on every hour on the hour. So on our left here, we are seeing the River East, multiple different kinds of buildings. These are residential, the ones on the riverfront, the stuff in apartments, townhomes with towers, the white uh, kind of tower you see in between them. That's Robert Stern. Uh, he's a New York architect. And uh, that's called Bennett Place. And of course, in front of us is DuSable Lakeshore Drive. And on the left, just east of uh, Lakeshore Drive, is Lake Point Tower. Now, Lake Point Tower is 1968. And it is by two students of Ms. Figaro, by the name of Shipley Heinrich. Uh, and you might say, it looks a little lonely out there by itself, right? Well, after this building was built, a law was passed that said no more building east of Richard Drive to protect our lakefront. But what about this big kind of uh, construction area over here with the plywood? Well, if you'd just been here 10 years ago, we were talking about the Calatrava Tower, 92-story condo tower spiraling up to the sky. They got all the way, they built their foundations all the way down to bedrock, seven stories, and ran out of money. So today we have one of the world's biggest holes on our riverfront. This is, uh, by the way, two new uh, multi-story buildings by Skidmore are planned for that area. Stusavo, Lakeshore Drive. And as we come from underneath a very busy thoroughfare, on our left again is Lake Point Tower. And uh, this little grassy area here, well, they are hoping that that will become Stusavo Park. Uh, they've actually named designers for it, but I'm going to be honest with you, we've been talking about Dusado Park since the 1980s. So hopefully it will happen. Uh, coming up in front of us on the left, 1916. And this today is known as Navy Pier, originally Municipal Pier. Done by Charles Sumner Frost, it was a pier for deep draft vessels when we were a major port city. We're not anymore, so it's now a big recreational area. Uh, the Ferris wheel, it's a much smaller Ferris wheel, even though it's a great way to get a view of the city, than the original Ferris wheel uh, ever, which was at the Columbian Exposition in 1893. This one is much smaller than it. Uh, you do have the Shakespeare Theater. Uh, that is the yard, the white tent-like area that you see on the Ferris wheel. And another theater is in the main building. Uh, you got boat rides, you've got uh, the children's theater there. Uh, you have lots of stuff happening. It's one of the major uh, tourist attractions in the downtown area. New hotel, by the way. All right, so uh, one or two boats have returned to the harbor. They all must leave in the spring, so it's always fun when they come back. But it, directly in front of the boat, well, you might have been wondering, how do I get to the lake? Well, that's the lake there, Lake Michigan, one of the five great lakes, the only one that is entirely within the boundary of the United States. That was a jeopardy question. Uh, how do you get from the river to the lake? You go through the locks done by the Army Corps of Engineers in the 1930s. This is a great time as you're checking out the skyline in Navy Pier to tell you, you are traveling on an engineering wonder of the world. Chicago River, it flows backwards. Originally, Chicago River flowed into Lake Michigan. 
not a good idea to pollute your river and then send it to your drinking water. So in 1900, they dig the sanitary and ship canal. And very simply put, that uses gravity to pull the Chicago River away from Lake Michigan and send our dirty water to somebody else's drinking water. Sorry, St. Louis. There have been many lawsuits. Do not worry about them. But as we make our turn here, glorious day that this is. First off, let's take a look to the left. And you're seeing, again, some of that new outside. Now, the museum campus juts into the lakefront. You see the, uh, the planetarium's dome there, the planetarium, the aquarium, uh, and the field museum are all located on there. Then all of this major area. But you know what? You are seeing what Chicago is most proud of. Yeah, our architecture, but also the amount of open land that we have along our lakefront. We've got a couple of people to thank for that. Daniel Burnham in his uh, Chicago plan of 1905, but also Montgomery Ward. Montgomery Ward went to court three times, all the way to the Illinois Supreme Court, to stop Marshall Field from building his field museum, about where Buckingham, uh, that was Buckingham Fountain <laughs> is today. Uh, he said that this was to be deeded to the people of Chicago to be, quote, forever open, clear, and free. And that has been the basis of lawsuits that have stopped everything from children's museums to Star Wars museums from being built on our work fronts. All right, so as we are coming back toward Lakeshore Drive, uh, you see the white kind of smaller uh, bridge. That is the Navy Pier flyover. <laughs> it took years and years to get that done. But finally, they separate pedestrian and cars and bikers uh, from, again, Lakeshore Drive. But take a look in front of the boat. There are three kind of steps that you see there. Now, this building is today called the St. Regis. For the longest time during construction, we were calling it the Vista. And it was designed by Jeannie Gang, a studio game. The Vista is going to be the third tallest building in Chicago at 100 stories. Uh, the Vista is very interesting. It's a building. Jeannie Gang is, you know, very well known for her other building, the Aqua, and this building at 100 stories makes it the tallest building designed by a woman architect in the world. Hopefully there will be more. Oh, wow. um, It is a floor that allows the wind to blow through that section. And what does that do for them? Well, it helps with the bashing of the wind onto the building itself. By not enclosing it, the wind doesn't bash too and move the building a little bit. What you have is the wind going through it. Now, Studio Gang also has used many different kinds of shapes in its design. What we see at the base of this building, you see that's where the hotel is going to be, there's like a cube, but notice there is kind of what we call, it kind of looks like an upside down popcorn box that you were seeing there. Those are called frustrums, and the entire building is actually based on that shape. What they do is, uh, the building is not going in and out like this, what they do is they build the core of the building, and then the glass, they build six inches out, six inches, they go up another inch, another inch, another inch, and they go in six inches, another inch, another inch. It also uses many different kinds of glass in here. Uh, if you're in the colder section, they have a kind of glass that allows more light and heat in. If you're on a hotter section, it's a little darker. So, this here is the oldest section of our river walkway. Uh, and where the American flag is, that's a memorial to uh, men and women who made submarines during World War II. 
Uh, well, I have one here. Well, it turns out submarines actually were made in Manitowoc, Wisconsin, and on their way to war, would come down the Chicago River. By the way, this boat was made in Manitowoc, Wisconsin. On our left, the triangular-shaped building, Harry Weiss. This is a Swiss hotel from the early 1990s, and when it was done, it had a nice wide wall on the lakefront. And just behind the Swiss hotel uh, is Jeannie Gang's Aqua. Now, the Aqua, again, out of Studio Gang, is a vertical kind of building, but take a look at those undulating kind of balconies. Also, that you have almost like a pooling effect for reflective glass that is there. So, all of this on our left hand side is Illinois. Uh, and as we take a look in front of us and on the right, we see, of course, the Tribune Tower. And just to the right of that, with the onion down there, that's the Intercontinental Hotel. 1929 by Walter Allschlag was uh, the Medina Athletic Club. And it had a Middle Eastern kind of that onion that you see there. They had a great idea for it in 1929. 1929, the entire country was fascinated with dirigibles, hot air balloons. So they actually bought dirigibles from land off of the Madonna Athletic Club. So of course, after the engine blew up, there were no dirigibles. So you can see again the Madonna Athletic Club, Stadium into the Continental Hotel. And as we're coming back, Toward the dock. On our left, this is Illinois Center, uh, originally called, uh, again, Railroad Land. And you're seeing some of the older buildings here. Uh, this is the Hyatt Hotel, flanked on either side by Illinois Center 1 and Illinois Center 2. And if you look just behind the first brown Hyatt, you can see a spire there. That's the Prudential 2 building, done by Lobo, Schlossman, and Hackle. In the 1990s, again, we're doing our deco art in row. People think it looks a little like the Chrysler building in New York City. And of course, the big black building that you see in front of us, that's again Illinois Center, and it is the home of the Chicago Architecture Center. If you've taken this boat ride, admission is $5, and we invite you to come in, or you can just you know, check out the Again, bookstore as well. But as we move back to the docks, it's a good time just to recap where we've been. We started out with the historic Ridley Building, 1921-1924, very neoclassical. Of course, we jumped over uh, to the Trump. Trump, uh, again, not by the historic district, but very much the big, bigger, and biggest element here. Uh, and just behind it, we have Louise Van Der Rohe, what was the IBM building? Andrew Goldberg, the Green City. Then we are back to the London House with its nice little temple up at the top. And again, this has been a Chicago Architecture Center tour. We get lots of tours, and now that we're back, we have the idea. Um, there are so much to do in Chicago today, as you have noticed. I have never seen so many Chicagoans out for the last two years. Everybody's out and enjoying it. Head over to Millennium Park. Uh, go see Amish Kapoor's Cloudgate. Do not ask anybody who's Cloudgate. They won't know what you're talking about. Ask them where the bean is. It's just over in Millennium Park. Uh, you can also see uh, Lorenzo Piano's addition to the Art Institute. While you're headed that way, our cultural center. Cultural Center used to be our library. It's filled with Tiffany mosaics. They've just opened up two of the domes. Totally free, good place to go and do that. Um, I'm sure there's a Cub game today, uh, or not. Anybody headed that way? Well, ah, all right, sunscreen. Um, but <laughs> there's just a lot going on in the city. Chicago is a great city, and I live here, so I know that. And we are so happy that you are here. Go out and enjoy the city. Thanks for coming.
Great. Thank you very much. We are going to ask that you stay seated until the captain gives the all clear. Uh, and, and again, if you have any questions, you know, just let me know. But uh, now there's tons and tons to do. If it's not a Macy's sale, there's some festival happening somewhere. So again, uh, stay seated till the all clear is given. Thanks again. The ramps are set. It is safe for you to disembark. Remember to watch your step. Watch your head if you are exiting from the lower level. Uh, make sure you double check your area. Ensure that you have all of your belongings before you head out. Cash bags, wallets, cell phones, etc. If you hang on to your ticket stubs from today's tour, you can take those up to the Chicago Architecture Center. They have a really excellent exhibition that they've curated for you. Uh, those uh, tickets entitle you to a $5 entrance. More about the city of Chicago. We hope you enjoyed your time on board Chicago's Emerald Lady, that you learned something. Uh, if you have any additional questions, Karen will eventually be making her way uh, outside to the top of the boarding area. Come back and see us again in the future. found the sign so you know where to find it uh, this is the boat we were just on the actual boat that we rode is named the first lady so lady but we specifically took the tour with with the architecture foundation and let me do a thumbnail shot over here for, real quick That was a really fun tour, highly recommend it. Um, had a blast. Uh, 
as you can see from the entire tour. <laughs> it, in person, it's truly breathtaking. And even if you've seen the video and you plan to travel to Chicago, do come in person because it is worth it. Uh, just seeing this, these views is a really great way to see Chicago from a perspective that you usually don't see. I uh, really can't see in many other ways. So here's the front of the boat. Another screenshot over here. There we go. Another. Um... <laughs> Gotta get the thumbnail. So that was a very interesting way of seeing the city because as you can see that Chicago is truly an open air museum of architecture. Just like a city like Rome or Paris or London has their life. Unfortunately, Chicago doesn't appear to have too many ferries. I'm not sure if even the. I'm not sure if there's a really cheap way of doing a river. Um, any Chicagoans out there? So, if you have any last remaining questions, the compliments about the camera work. Ibrahima says, I can't wait to see the replay. Yes, enjoy it. So I will be back at 3 p.m. Chicago time, 4 p.m. New York City time, 9 p.m. UK time. I'll be back. Or like Gardner Schwarzenegger said, I'll be back. But let me, sh let me show you the ticket office. Right here is the ticket office. So the ticket office is on East Wacker Drive on the east side. So the opposite side of Wrigley. Opposite side of Trump on this side. It not seem like it got sold out. I would suggest even buying the ticket in person to save yourself about $10. I spend way too much because they use Ticketmaster. So as you can... So as you can see, in, per, in person, it's only $55. For some reason, their website uses Ticketmaster. If you don't know what Ticketmaster is, it's the way to buy tickets, uh, usually for concerts and sports games. And they charge an insane amount of fees. Ticketmaster has gotten issues. There's countless lawsuits made against them uh, throughout the years. And I was charged, wow, $11 more than I needed to pay. Uh, and doesn't seem to get really too sold out at this moment in time. Maybe in summertime it's in really high demand. Maybe it's worth getting a ticket ahead of time, but it passes on the hour. And they also have it in the evening. So everyone, thank you so much for tuning in. That was the Architecture Boat Tour. I'll be back 3 p.m. for some awesome and always keep on exploring. Have a great day, everyone. Cue the music. Alexa, play Chicago by Sufjan Stevens. Okay, Google, play Chicago by Sufjan Stevens. Listen to that song because it is a great song about Chicago. Have a great day.